Hello friends! Recently we did a video analysing my journey reading fantasy in the last two years. I went through every fantasy book I've read since the beginning of 2022 and we basically had a look at the commonalities that the books I didn't like and the books that I did like had. And there were quite a few takeaways from that video but the big one for me personally was that historical fantasy. Historical fantasy is something I need to read more because it seems to be something I tend to really like. And essentially in this video I want to put that theory to the test. I have seven historical fantasy books that I've been meaning to get to and it is time. It is time my friends to sit down and read those books. Now seven books is an awful lot of reading so I'm pretty sure this is going to be a long video so make sure you got yourself a cup of tea and get comfy because by the end of this video I want to know definitively Am I in my historical fantasy era? So let's just very quickly introduce the books and then we're going to get straight into the reading. Firstly we've got The Midnight Bargain by C.L. Polk. This is a book I picked up immediately after I finished reading Even Though We Knew the End by C.L. Polk. That's an historical fantasy novella and I just loved it so I knew I needed to read more from this author. Then the only book that I don't have a physical copy here to show you is Keeper of Enchanted Rooms by Charlie Ann Holmberg. I think this one is more like cozy and it has got a romance so I'm interested to see how we find this one. Next up is the book that I probably had on my shelf the longest. It is A Skin Full of Shadows by Frances Hardinge. I got this book from work last year sometime because a lot of my colleagues really love Frances Hardinge and recommend her all the time. I know there's ghosts and I think one possesses a little girl so I think it's gonna be a little bit spooky. Next up we've got The Monsters We Defy by Leslie Penelope. I think this one has ghosts or spirits as well. I don't know a lot about this one. The only thing I explicitly remember is I think it's set in like the 1920s kind of jazz age and it's like loosely inspired by the Harlem Renaissance. Then then I think the only book on this list that is not a standalone, I've got The Sorcerer to the Crown by Zen Cho. This one is set in Regency England and I think our main character is a black man and I think through that lens we're going to explore some themes around racism and colonialism. Next up we've got The Tread of Angels by Rebecca Roanhorse. Now this is a novella, it's definitely the shortest book that we're reading in this video and honestly I don't know anything about this book, I just stumbled across it online on a secondhand book website. I saw the little tag historical fantasy and I bought it. It was as simple as that. And then finally we're going to read The Magician's Daughter by H.G. Parry. Now I think this is by an author from New Zealand and I think this one is set in the late 1800s early 1900s in Ireland and it's based on like actual mythology and legends and like fairy tales. Also I do remember hearing that there are familiars in this and like I mean give me a talking animal and I'm probably gonna say yes. So these plus one are the books we're gonna be reading in this video. It is quite a lot of reading but I am just I'm ready to really kind of know once and for all if historical fantasy is a rabbit hole I need to keep falling down because so far it's really working for me. So I have very high hopes for these books and for this video. But there's only one way to find out isn't there? Let's get to reading. Okay so I finished The Midnight Bargain and oh my god I feel like <laughs> I feel like we have started this vlog off strong, almost too strong if I'm being perfectly honest. I just I honestly don't see how we can continue going up from here. We will keep reading and I hope I continue to love the books but to put it plainly this is this is one of my favorite books that I've read so far this year. It's 400 pages. I read it in an afternoon and I read it so quickly because I was just having so much fun and I couldn't put it away. I, I know that I want to reread this. I already know that. Partly because I feel like I just didn't linger with the story enough and I'm sure there's bits and pieces that I missed. But I mean when you're having that much fun like you don't want to get off the roll coaster you know. Anyway this is set in kind of like an equivalent of like a Regency era uh, and it did give me like kind of vaguely Pride and Prejudice vibes but obviously a little bit of magic thrown in there as well. Our main character's name is Beatrice and she's a young woman who like this is her first bargaining season which is like essentially like her first season you know like they've got a six-week period uh, where they've got all these parties and stuff and they meet people and they're trying to find a husband. And one of the th reasons that it kind of reminded me a little bit of Pride and Prejudice is like the standing of this family in society. Like obviously their aristocracy to even be a part of this bargaining society situation but their father has made some bad business decisions in the past and he doesn't have a son which means that their wealth and their security going forward it's a little bit precarious. Basically they're the poor rich people if you know what I mean. Anyway what's this story about? Well Beatrice kind of has a lot of pressure on her to find a good match because her father, he's, he's broke. And so their family is now relying on Beatrice to make a good match, to pay their debts, so that her younger sister Harriet will also be able to have a season in a few years and also 
find a husband. So there's a lot of pressure on our dear old Beatrice. However, in this world, uh, there are some people who have magic. Both men and women have magic. However, it is only men who are encouraged or even allowed really to practice any kind of like significant form of magic beyond like what they call little rhyming spells when they're children. Because in this world, magic is seen as quite dangerous. So men have kind of like this secret society where they can go and learn and practice magic in like a controlled way. Whereas women, when they marry, they are forced, rather than a ring, they get this collar that goes around their neck that suppresses their magic. But basically the only women who really practice any form of significant magic are like older women. Like after they've gone through menopause is the only time they're allowed in this society to take off these horrible collars. Beatrice though, she has kind of like managed to uncover some grimoires and decode them. So she's been like secretly practicing magic throughout her teens and she really doesn't want to give it up. She loves magic. She wants to become a magician, just like the men are allowed to be. But obviously if she gets married, like that will just be completely taken away from her. And so she comes up with this kind of like plan to convince her father to let her become a magician, like a proper magician, um, and she will help him in business. But I mean, that all just gets a little bit messy. Uh, and then we are introduced to a brother and sister duo who are from a different country. The sister also doesn't really want to get married and she wants to be a magician. Uh, the brother starts to get the hots for our main character. So this is definitely like an historical fantasy romance. Like this is a romance story in terms of like the characters and the plot. But to be perfectly honest, while I didn't like hate the romance or anything, it was far from my favorite part of the story. I want to be careful of giving too much away uh, because I mean, this is just sort of quite a fast paced a uh, fairly straightforward kind of a plot. And as I'm sure you've gathered with all of this like conversation of like the difference between men and women in this society and like the literal collars that kind of like deny women their magic, like <laughs> the, the themes and the explorations and the ideas, they're all very explicit and on the nose, which is not something I always like, but I think because I liked Beatrice so much and because I just enjoyed like the way that the symbolism of the collar was like conveyed, like, I mean, I cried several times through this book because it was just so strong and powerful. There's one scene in particular with Beatrice and her mother that I won't go into, but if you've read this book, like, it broke me. It absolutely broke me. I thought it was so powerful and the imagery was just so strong. I also just really enjoyed the magic. Like it's all very witchy, you know, like they cast circles and they essentially invoke spirits. And the spirit that uh, Beatrice invokes early on is like the spirit of luck and fortune. And like their relationship and their dynamic, I think was my favorite part of this book. And although this does deal with some heavier topics, you know, like oppression, uh, it does it in a way that is both quite honest and forthright, but also like overall the tone of this is quite fun. Like it's sad and it's harrowing and it's infuriating, but it's also just really beautiful. And so I don't know if this is listed as a young adult book. To me, it felt like an adult book. But I think it's one of those books that would also be appropriate for older teenagers who are like interested in reading some historical fantasy romance. I also really loved the way that like allyship was kind of explored and especially how that played out with the love interest and how uh, his kind of like allyship was really challenged. So obviously I am left feeling like either this is like definitely confirmation that I am in fact an historical fantasy girly or it might mean that I am on the precipice of like discovering a new favorite author. Like that's how I feel right now, especially given that even though I knew the end by this author has so far been my favorite book that I've read this year. And now I found another one. And I will say that if you've read that novella, I mean, it's very different. It's a very different story and it is a bit more adult, but like the tone and the atmosphere, I think like if you liked that about the novella, like you'll find that in this book too. And so I do actually have another book by this author, Witchmark, and this is, I think, the first in a trilogy. Again, it's historical fantasy. I think this one's got a little bit more of a mystery and it is a queer romance in this one. I need to get to this sometime this year. In the meantime, I don't know that this is a book that I would necessarily recommend to everyone. Like I said, it is pretty straightforward. Uh, the themes and the ideas are explored in metaphors that are pretty on the nose, but I think the magic and the female centered relationships and in particular, our main character Beatrice are what carry this book and are the reasons that I enjoyed it as much as I did. All of that is to say, a very, very strong start and a big, big tick in favor of historical fantasy for me. Welcome back. 
Earlier this morning, I finished Keeper of Enchanted Rooms by Charlie Ann Holmberg. I had this on my Kindle, so I don't have a physical book here to share with you. Um, how do I say that I hated this book without saying I hated this book? I was expecting us to come down a little bit after the last book, but I was not expecting us to crash and burn as hard and fast as we did. And you know how you can tell I really didn't like something? It's when it's when I come prepared with notes. Huh, <sighs> okay, where do we start? This book is set in kind of like the 1830s to 1840s. Um, a little bit in England, but mostly in America. We are introduced to the concept of magic inherited through bloodlines, probably from Jesus's apostles, because there's 11 or 12 different kinds of magic that are associated with different gemstones. This magic thing is like a legit science, to the point where a lot of aristocracy in particular, in order to keep magic alive in England, they're like, you know, selectively breeding for particular kinds of magic. Amongst the commoners though, magic has pretty much been bred out. And so magic is not a super common thing in America because even though it's from Jesus's apostles, this magic originates in England and Europe or is most highly concentrated there. I don't know. I mean, this already feels like whitewashing and I haven't even got to the plot yet. We also discover though, that sometimes this magic can be embedded into a house or a building. And at the beginning of the book, we are introduced to Merritt, who is like a bit of a nobody who has surprisingly inherited a house on an island that has not been lived in for a hundred years. And he goes and it turns out it's haunted it's magical. And so uh, the, what is it? The biker, the Boston Institute Keeper of Enchanted Rooms, I guess is the rest of that acronym. I've already forgotten. Assign him like a housekeeper to come and help get the house under control. Her name is Holder and basically her job is to go around and kind of like soothe and take care of these magical houses to like protect them because there's so few of them remaining, they must be protected. Okay, so why didn't I like this book? Well, as I already said, it just feels very whitewashy, even down to the point where it's like kind of, it's pretty explicitly said that the US is like a new country that doesn't have very much magic at all, which just leaves you feeling like, like do the indigenous people of the Americas not have their own systems of magic? Probably. If there is magic in this world, like assuming that only white people have it for some reason seems weird. At one point it was the villain of the story, but like he literally describes the US as a purged slate, which felt very icky. And there is just a couple of mentions throughout the book of the US being like a new country, which like I understand literally the US of A as it is today is a new country, but like the land and the peoples who live there have existed for much longer than that. And this book just kind of like acted as if that was not true, which I will come back to in a little bit, but let's keep going through my issues with this book. Another thing that just felt a little bit icky to me, it's not outright like hateful problematic, but it just felt icky was the magic itself and the way that we are constantly reminded of how it's like inherited through bloodlines and how there are like these breeding systems to like hook people up to make sure that their magic will continue. It all just felt a little bit too close to eugenics for me, you know? The characters themselves were very flat and one note, I felt personally. No, you don't have to write likable characters, but you do have to write at least a few engaging characters. And I don't feel like this book had those. I will say that this book felt primarily like a romance with like a veneer of fantasy. I did find the magic system itself quite interesting, but in terms of the story and the plot, primarily what's driving it is the romance and primarily what we care about is the romance. In theory, I didn't care about the romance at all, <laughs> which I do think is a valuable lesson for me going forward. I think a lot of, especially like cozy fantasy tends to have a heavy romantic like subplot or plot. I'm not looking for romanticy, basically is what I'm saying. Speaking of the romance, while I was not invested in it and I didn't care for either of the characters, the third act conflict, is that what the romance buffs call it? Ugh, I have a hard time with third act conflicts in at the best of times. This one was awful. It was the kind of conflict where they just say horrible things to each other. I'm not rooting for that. <laughs> I think too, the whole romance kind of felt quite prudish, if I can say that. It all felt very chaste. And the female protagonist, Holder, like her whole thing was that she'd never been kissed and she thought she was super ugly and that no man would ever have her. And like, I'm not saying that there is not a place for those characters. I just like, it's not the kind of female protagonist I want to read about in a romance kind of setting. And to be perfectly honest, 
I wanted the house to feel like more of a character than it did. I wanted it to have more personality than it did, especially considering we learned that uh, like a large part of the magic of this house is chaocracy. I think it is. It's like magic of chaos. And I mean, yeah, it moves a couple of rooms around and sometimes turns the stairs into sli a slide, but that's kind of it. If we're talking about chaos magic, like I was expecting more. I wanted it to get full wacky and weird, you know, and it just, it never did. So the house was a cute, fun element, but I wouldn't go so far as to say that it felt truly embodied and it felt like a true character in and of itself. And to be perfectly frank, that was one of the main reasons I picked this book up because I tend to love like settings that become a character, whether like literally or just because they're so well evoked. That's something I really tend to enjoy. So I had high hopes for that element and it just never quite played out for me. This book was a bit of a slog for me. I did finish it, although I did genuinely think about DNFing it several times. The only reason I pushed through is because I did feel like I was learning about my personal reading taste while reading it and it was a quick read. I started it last night and I finished it this morning. Honestly, if it had taken me into tomorrow, I probably would have just DNF'd it. So what are some takeaways for me here? I think, yeah, the whole romantic thing, probably not for me. I'm sure there are some exceptions to the rule, but generally I think it's something I will mostly steer clear of unless there's something really special about a particular book that really piques my interest. And then I think finally, one of the big things that I've often struggled with, with historical fiction in general, but especially when it comes to historical fantasy, is just tackling some of the shitty things of our past. So it's not that I need an author to choose a particular way to handle the past in order for me to like it, but I think the thing that kind of draws all of the books that I do like together is the fact that it feels like at the very least, the author was intentional about the way that they tackled it. Whereas books like this one, like it doesn't feel like the author really thought about how they were gonna tackle history, especially around colonization and dispossession. It just didn't feel like there was thought there. And even with like the whole eugenics bloodline shit, it just didn't feel like there was any thought there to actual history. Now I have seen on Goodreads that this book has very high ratings so it seems like most people are really <laughs> enjoying it. There were some redeeming factors that made me not absolutely hate this book but by the end of it I was just exhausted. I didn't enjoy it. But anyway I'm done ranting about this book that I honestly I just want to forget that I wasted like six hours reading so let's move on to the next one. We've gone from bad to worse. As we've already established, I really didn't like The Keeper of Enchanted Rooms. For book number three, I thought I was on to an absolute winner. Like I thought this was a certainty for at the very least a book I really would like. I've low-key had this book on my shelf for so long because I thought it was gonna be a new favorite. Like that's what I was diving into. And it is A Skin Full of Shadows by Frances Hardinge. I have heard so many good things about this author. This book is set in the 1700s, I think. It's around like the English Civil War. And I mean, I'll tell you a little bit about it, but to be perfectly honest, um, I didn't get that far in. I got to page 99 and I'm DNFing it. I can't, I cannot continue. In this book, we follow a 12 year old girl, I think, and her name is Maypiece. And very early on, we established that Maypiece has a pretty tense relationship with her mother. She's a single mother and she kind of refuses to tell Maypiece anything about her father or their history. Additionally, Maypiece sees spirits. They come to her often at night and kind of, she has these kind of like nightmares where they're basically like trying to claw their way in to her. And at one point her mother just like locks her in a room in like a graveyard or something and is like, learn to fight them. Like her mother's a very cold person who like clearly has been through a lot and like we figure probably has her reasons but I mean it's not a nice way to treat a 12 year old is it? And so we literally watch as Maypiece spends the night in the pitch black dark by herself in the cold as these different spirits and creatures like torment her and try and like make their way into her body. And although she does manage to fight these spirits off during the evening, at some point something happens where Maypiece does end up with a spirit in her. And it's the spirit of a dead bear. This bear seems to have been like tortured and abused by humans, so it's quite sensitive. And although Maypiece knows that she like shouldn't let a spirit in her and she like it's a bad thing to have a spirit in her, at the same time, I don't know, she kind of feels this kinship and she feels pity in a lot of ways for the bear as well. And so in a way they kind of like take refuge together and like there's quite like a sensitive bond forming it seems. So there are elements of this that I like in theory and I do think it's kind of funny that I'm DNFing this and I didn't DNF 
The Keeper of Enchanted Rooms because like I think that that is like objectively a much worse book. The difference though is that was just a really quick easy read so like you know taking a couple of hours just to push through it really wasn't that much effort on my part. This though I mean it's not that it's hard to read I think this is written with younger people in mind however there's something about like the tone and the tone of voice that is just utterly dull. Like the writing it all seems quite beautiful but it's just it doesn't have any sense of emotion I suppose. Like there is technically tension because stuff's happening but I don't feel any of it. There's a couple of things that I'm kind of thinking might explain my struggles with this book. I mean first and foremost it's just a taste thing right? Like for whatever reason I'm just not vibing with this book and with this story. The other thing I could think of is that maybe I'm just not really interested in this time and place. But I think the thing that maybe more rings home true for me is that I don't generally like reading more adult books. Like I said I know that the age range for this book is a little bit more blurry than that but like I don't really like reading a more like an older voice about younger characters. I think upon reflection it just very rarely works for me but I think generally speaking like I just keep feeling like I would much rather be reading this story told as a middle grade. Like there's no whimsy to it, there's no sense of atmosphere, there's no charm and when I'm reading from a 12 year old who is like possessed essentially by a bear I want whimsy, I want atmosphere, I want charm. I don't want it just to be depressing and dull, you know? Like that's just not what I want from a story like this. I'm just not enjoying reading from Maypiece's perspective. So like I said, I only got 100 pages into this, barely a quarter, and I just, I, I cannot bring myself to pick it up again. Not because I'm mad at it, not because it's terrible, but just because it's dull. And I'm a little bit sad about it, but I don't want to linger for too long on a book that I'm not even finishing. I still have high hopes for this whole experiment and I feel like even though I'm bummed that I'm not finishing this book and that I didn't like it, like I am, I have to remind myself that I am learning about my reading taste even through the books that I don't like. In fact in some ways I learn more. So I'm gonna finish my cup of tea and I'll be back to chat with you soon about another book. And here's hoping we have a bit of a better time with it. Because I mean in this video at least it's two strikes so far for historical fiction and three you're out, right? I'll see you soon. We are back with a winner, baby! This video is turning out to be an absolute roller coaster because believe it or not, I just read a five star. This has to be one of my favorite books of the year. This was incredible. This is The Monsters We Defy by Leslie Penelope and I, I'm in love. Absolutely in love. This book is set in the 1920s in Washington in a black community and in fact I think, I think all of the characters bar maybe one cop is black. And this was just an absolute delight. I loved it from start to finish and honestly at this moment I am both overjoyed at finding a new favourite book and devastated that it's not a series and that Leslie doesn't have more books just like this for me to read. Our main character is Clara and she's a young black woman living in Washington and she can speak to spirits and she primarily talks to a kind of spirit called enigmas who are kind of like these intelligent spirit figures who you can bargain with and you can make deals with. And so in that way a part of this kind of reminded me of Even Though I Knew the End by C.L. Polk which we know is a favourite of mine. Like the spirits do manifest differently in this story but the way that you know uh, like a deal with the devil, a deal with a spirit is often made in desperation and a lot of the time people don't really know what they're bargaining for even though it's all right there in the wording. So this is firmly an historical fantasy but it also has a very strong mystery element and honestly the plot feels like a heist movie. And in this world in particular it seems like when people make a deal with an enigma they get two things. They get some kind of talent or gift but they also get what they call a trick which is kind of like a really shitty negative consequence of their gift. And we know pretty early on that Clara is one of the people who has made a bargain with one of these enigmas but we don't really understand what her gift and her trick is yet. Anyway early on she is given the opportunity by one of the enigmas to basically like like rid herself of her bargain. So she will lose her gift but she will also lose her trick. And it seems like a lot of people who make these kind of deals with the enigmas like they do want to rid themselves of the bargain and be able to get out of the contract because obviously for a lot of them uh, the costs outweigh the benefits. And so Clara is very keen to have the opportunity to rid herself of her contract. All she has to do is steal a ring from one of the most famous people in town. And it's a ring that this woman is wearing so it's not going to be easy. And so she kind of starts to put together like a ragtag bunch of people most of whom also have made bargains with enigmas at some point to help her steal this
this ring. But along the way, people start to go missing and like the mystery just is clearly much bigger than any of them bargained for. And so while they are motivated by getting this ring and freeing themselves of their bargain and their contract, like the stakes, the stakes quickly escalate. So this is definitely solidly like an historical fantasy. It's got that great setting, that great sense of atmosphere, but it's also a really good mystery with essentially a heist at the center. Honestly, this is one of those books that I don't want to spoil too much for you because it is just such a fun ride, but it's also hard for me not just to sit here and gush about it. I just, I loved it. It was so fun to read. It was so compelling and engrossing. I loved the characters. I loved how we got like little snippets of their backstory. So we really felt like we knew them as people the stakes overall for the community felt pretty high but there were also stakes for our individual characters as well and like I really understood why each person was involving themselves in this whole thing. It was beautifully written, but it wasn't overdone. Like it did so much in only what, like 300 and something pages? 350 pages, amazing. It was all just so vivid. And I kept thinking that this would make an amazing movie or even like a TV show. I am left desperately wishing, hoping, praying, willing to bargain with a spirit for Leslie to write more books not necessarily a sequel, but just more books in this world, you know? In the same way that after I finished The Golem and the Ginny by Helene Wecker, I just wanted to be in that world again. I just wanted to be with the characters again. I feel the same about this. I just loved it. It was a little bit dark. It was sad at times, but it was also just quite funny and fun. The pace just worked perfectly for me. Like it never felt like it slowed down, but at the same time, I never felt like I was skipping smaller moments with characters either. I don't know. It just, it feels really well-rounded and a really well-executed book. And just a fabulous story, a fabulous story that I'm going to continue to think about and I'm gonna miss until the next time I get around to rereading it. So genuinely, if you have any kind of comp titles for this one, I need to know. Please let me know in the comments because I just want more of whatever this is. And although I'm kind of talking about just how much fun this was to read and how great the setting was and how wonderful the characters were, there were also some pretty like powerful themes throughout as well, especially around community and how it's the people at the margins who often get sacrificed or get hurt or get harmed first and how all too often it's easy to over look those people but you know like the margins like they keep creeping in if we keep ignoring the problem and so while it is easy for some people you know with the most privilege and power to ignore what's happening on the fringes of their community at the end of the day we sink and swim together and that is especially true for this black community in like a Harlem Renaissance inspired Washington because there is some really interesting exploration of like class and privilege within the black community in this book and although that doesn't overtake just how enjoyable this is to read overall it was like a really interesting interesting and I think well executed element of it all. That definitely for me added a level of weight and intrigue and poignancy to the book overall. I am going to be riding the high of this book for a little while, but I'm interested to see if this continues to be a roller coaster or if maybe we're on a bit of a winning streak. I honestly have pretty high hopes for the next book, so let's find out. I've read not one, but two books since I spoke to you last. We have a little bit of catching up today and Ollie's here to help me out with these reviews. So let's get started. Firstly, I read The Sorcerer to the Crown by Zen Cho. This is the first in a duology, I think. And I mean, if you want to know if I liked it, I've already bought the second book. So I think that tells you something. This one is set in kind of like a Regency era England. And we follow our main character, Zacharias. He's a young black man who was previously enslaved but his kind of like adopted father purchased him slash adopted him when he was a child. This man was the sorcerer to the crown. He's kind of like the head sorcerer guy. His name was Sir Stephen and he bought and then adopted Zachariah when he was a kid to basically train him in magic and then present him to the magicians in England as proof that black people can also do magic. And after he passes away, Zacharias basically like inherits his role and he becomes the sorcerer to the crown. And we can see how, especially growing up, Zacharias idolized Sir Stephen in a lot of ways. He really looked up to him and did think of him as some kind of father figure. But I think this book does nuance so well because there's also a lot of space for Zacharias's anger, fear, confusion, frustration, resentment over essentially being bought and used to prove a point. The fact that Sir Stephen never bought slash freed Zacharias's family. A lot of stuff like that. A lot of very complicated, messy feelings were all explored in a very sensitive, beautiful, heartbreaking, honest kind of way. But I'm getting ahead of myself because that is only part of the story. Essentially, when Zacharias comes to power as the Sorcerer Royal, it's at a time when English magic is in decline. We learn that magic 
in this world essentially comes from the land of Fae. And for whatever reason, the fairies are kind of distributing more magic around the rest of the world than they are in Britain anymore. And so a lot of the English sorcerers are getting very concerned about this situation. Essentially, they are becoming a lot less powerful in the face of other countries around the world gaining more power. Definitely some interesting parallels and commentary on England and colonialism at this time, for sure. So it's kind of the Sorcerer Royal's job to figure this out. But as a black man, Zacharias is facing an uphill battle. Not only has he been accused of killing his predecessor, Sir Stephen, he's also kind of facing accusations that it's like his fault that British magic is in decline or that he's sabotaging it or that he is like happy that this is happening. Anyway, as part of his duties, he decides to kind of travel to the land of Fae to figure out what's going on. But along the way, he stops in at this all girls boarding school. At this school, girls are basically taught how to suppress their magic because it is deemed too powerful for female bodies. And Zacharias witnesses how these girls are taught to like actively harm themselves in order to suppress their magic. And he becomes quite distressed by this. But on top of that, he has the realization that like English magic is apparently in decline and we're teaching half the population how to not be magical, like make it make sense. And while he's at this school, he meets a young girl named Prunella, who's an orphan and she's biracial. And he realizes that she has quite a talent for magic herself. And so he kind of takes her under his wing. They become friends and the story unfolds from there. Essentially, this is an historical fantasy book that directly uses an historical fantasy setting to explore the intersections of many identities and the way that oppression affects different people in different ways. It's explicitly but also metaphorically dealing with oppression around like colonialism, racism, sexism. And I thought it tackled all of those things, like I said, with so much nuance, a lot of heart, but also very directly. And I really, really enjoyed it. I like the way that Zacharias and Prunella, like the ways in which their characters are similar and they have shared experiences, but then also the ways in which their experiences differ. And so in a way they are kind of contrasted or juxtaposed to each other while also being good points of reference for comparison. Obviously with Sir Stephen and some other characters, like the whole white savior complex is definitely analyzed and interrogated in this as well. And on top of that, I just really enjoyed the story and the magic and the setting. I mean, there's fairies, there's dragons, there's familiars. In some ways this book is absolutely beautiful and in other ways it's utterly brutal. If I'm gonna be harsh on this book, I would say that there were elements of it that were a little clunkier than I think they needed to be. Although I really enjoyed my experience reading it, I think it did take a while to get going. The pacing was a little bit off from time to time, but it wasn't anything particularly horrendous. And overall, I just thought it was a really good solid read. And I loved Zacharias and Prunella and watching them develop individually, but also as they got to know each other as well. And I loved the politics of this world, how we saw like the really granular interpersonal politics, like between Zacharias and other sorcerers, but also how we kind Kind of got some pretty strong glimpses into how all of this was playing out on an international scale as well. I thought it was really clever, really effective, and especially for a reasonably small page count, it packed a lot in. And so I am definitely very much looking forward to reading the sequel. I don't know, I think it's just a duology. I don't know that there's any more books planned. I know I keep referencing C.L. Polk as like comparisons for all of these books. And to be perfectly honest, in some ways, this did remind me of The Midnight Bargain. I think in particular, the way that gender was explored in the historical context, obviously like this being a magical world and lots of different people having access to magic, but women in particular being denied access to their magic and not being allowed to practice it. I think this book has a much more nuanced kind of like interesting take on that whole concept. The Midnight Bargain was like quite blunt and it was a pretty linear straightforward kind of story. This one definitely felt like it had a lot more layers and complexity to it and I just really enjoyed the read. This is my first time reading Zen Cho, and I think this might have been her debut and I will definitely be reading more from this author. I thought it was wonderful. The next book I read is just a short novella. It's The Tread of Angels by Rebecca Roanhorse. This is another author who has plenty of books out that I know people are loving. This is my first time reading Rebecca Roanhorse though. And this one is listed under historical fiction and fantasy on Goodreads. And I mean, it vaguely has historical vibes, but unlike, you know, The Sorcerer to the Crown, which, you know, is pretty well set in Regency England, this one feels a little more vague in terms of the historical setting. It's just got a bit of that kind of old timey country Western vibe. I did also really like this book and I enjoyed having a bit of a shorter, snappier read. I will say that this packs an awful lot into such a short book. And I do feel like a reasonable criticism 
uh, that I'm sure plenty of people would have about this book is that it almost packs too much in. That there was plenty of stuff around the world building and some of the relationship dynamics and like the politics of this world that were just kind of mentioned and left. There wasn't a lot of detail there. I definitely feel like this is a story that could have been fleshed out more if Rebecca wanted to. Having said that, we know that I'm someone who tends to enjoy short snappy stories and kind of like with Even Though I Knew the End, that's a book that a lot of people say is too much for the page count. I loved it for what it was. I'm not saying that I think this is as strong as Even Though I Knew the End, although like I appreciate it in a similar way. My reading of this book was that it was a pretty strong allegory for race and racism. Essentially we learn that in this world there's a very strong hierarchical structure to society and in particular people are divided very strictly into the elect and the fallen. There are also demons and angels and like a pretty strong kind of implication that God is real or that the elect and the virtues are governing by divine right. And Celeste, our main character, is actually elect and fallen, but she's kind of like elect passing. But her sister Marielle, who she adores, is a fallen. And when Marielle is accused of killing a virtue, who's kind of like a fancy elect, Celeste basically does anything she can to protect her little sister, including getting involved with essentially the devil. So I won't tell you much more than that because obviously it's a very short book and so I don't want to spoil everything for you. Like I said, I felt like this whole society structure thing was a pretty clear allegory for racism in our world. But with Celeste having to solve this kind of whole murder mystery in amongst this very hierarchical world and kind of coming into contact and conflict with the different levels of this hierarchy. I did find that quite interesting. And so I think if you just kind of like let this story be a very small short story, I mean, like I had a good time with it, but I definitely did feel like there was plenty of elements of the world building that were a little bit lacking. For example, on top of there being like angels and demons and all of that sort of stuff going on, there is also this magic system that they just kind of call divinity. It almost read as just kind of like some sparkly magic that you can have access to. It can actually be used to like power different objects in this almost like steampunky kind of way, but it is not very well explained like what it is, where it comes from or how you use it. It's just kind of there. And honestly, it's not even a huge part of the story or the plot. I almost feel like it could have been done away with and just like the angels and demons like that was enough to create the you know slightly otherworldly kind of feeling for the story. There was also a lot of politics and corruption going on which definitely gave especially like the virtues and the elect this very sinister vibe but on top of that it's also just quite a powerful story of sisterhood as well and the complexities of that relationship dynamic when the two sisters are essentially from two different worlds. So it was a good fun read with like plenty of interesting things to chew on but I don't feel like it had the same kind of like depth and nuance that something like the Sorcerer to the Crown did. Obviously Sorcerer to the Crown had an awful lot more page count and a lot more words to develop interesting themes and concepts and even more of the world building. So I'm not really holding that against the Tread of Angels, but I do sort of feel like this is something that I don't know that it will stay with me for as long. That's not to say that I didn't like it. I definitely did. But I think of the books that I have enjoyed so far in this video, I'm probably less enthusiastic about this one than I am the others. To be fair, I have found two new favorite books of the year in this video. So I mean, the bar is very high. So I think it is fair to say now that we are back on a winning track with the historical fantasy. Fingers crossed we can keep it up. Historical fantasy, man, it's working for me. That's right. I finished The Magician's Daughter by H.G. Parry and this was just delightful. I read this book so quickly. I read it in two sittings. I could not put it down. Most of this book is set in the early 1900s. Some of it is in the kind of mid to late 1800s. But to parallel some of the other books that we have read in this video, magic is declining. Our main character's name is Biddy. She's a 16 year old girl who lives on this kind of like isolated secret magical island off the coast of Ireland. Yes, an island off the coast of Ireland. She's lived there her whole life ever since she can remember and she lives there with a magician named Rowan and his familiar rabbit named Hutchincroft. Biddy loves magic and she loves this island but she herself is not a magician. She doesn't have magic. She loves reading and she spends plenty of time in the library on the island reading books that Rowan brings back for her. And that's basically her only kind of window into the real world. And the older she gets, the more kind of claustrophobic she feels on this island and the more desire she has to travel and to experience the wider world for herself. But Rowan is always saying that this is just not possible, that it's too dangerous and that she can't. He himself though, often at nighttime, does leave the island and Biddy doesn't really know why. One night though, something goes wrong and Hutch wakes Biddy up 
up. He's really distraught, he's really upset, and basically something has happened to Rowan while he's off the island. And so from this incident we kind of learn a lot more about why Biddy and Rowan are on this island. What's been going on in the last like 70 or so years in England and Ireland? I don't really want to spoil much more of the details of the plot, but I will just say that this does get like a little bit involved with like politics amongst other mages and magicians. We also do learn more about the magic itself and why it's been in decline the last 70 years and how Rowan is involved in all of that. And although she doesn't have magic herself, Biddy ends up getting kind of tangled up in all of it. So while this didn't necessarily read as specifically YA to me, there is definitely a very strong coming of age narrative throughout this book. And I know we spoke about earlier how I don't necessarily love these kind of more elevated stories but told from a child's perspective. I loved Biddy and I loved her voice. I loved the journey we went on with her as a character. She does feel like age appropriate, she feels young, she feels naive, but she doesn't feel stupid and annoying, which I feel like sometimes authors confuse those characteristics. I really love the complexity of the relationship between Rowan and Biddy and I just loved Hutch, like the little rabbit familiar. He was I think my favourite character. There were some other characters that we met that I also really enjoyed getting to know more and figuring out whether they were goodies or baddies or how they were tangled up in the whole mess. And I just loved the elements of magic and whimsy in this world, obviously like the island that we are uh, first at, which is kind of isolated and hidden by magic. Like the trees are alive and there's these kind of spirits roaming around. I also really enjoyed the way that magic was used in this story, although there were plenty of things that felt very magical and there were magical things that some of our main characters did. By the very fact that magic is scarce in this story, it doesn't feel like they just kind of do magic willy-nilly. <laughs> There's not a magical answer to everything and anything. And in that way magic feels really special and sacred because it needs to be protected, it needs to be appreciated, and I suppose it kind of becomes this resource in the book. And how different people utilize that resource and respond to the scarcity is definitely a strong theme. There are some kind of like brutal, quite heartbreaking moments in this book, but overall I would say the tone is quite whimsical. And I did also like how there was like a small, but it was there, exploration of class. And in fact there was one paragraph that I just, I had to stop and reread several times because I just thought it was so heartbreakingly beautiful. I won't give you too much context so as to not spoil what's going on, but basically some really hard sad stuff is happening in the world to like regular people who don't have access to magic. And this is the first time Biddy has been kind of exposed to this kind of hardship and pain outside of just reading books. And so Biddy says, this wasn't like the hardship in books. It wasn't just that the characters in books weren't real and these people were. That part of it was obvious and expected. It was that the hardship in books was written. It had purpose. It was part of a story and however bleak it looked for the people inside the pages, that only meant there were more pages left before the end. Unless it was a tragedy or something Russian. Even then, things would work out the way they ought. But it wasn't true here. Pain was simply pain and there was nothing to do about it except to refuse to let it break you. So I suppose all of that kind of witnessing the world for what it really is, like the beauty and the absolute devastation, the suffering, the pain, is definitely a big part of Biddy's coming of age narrative but I just really liked the way that it was handled. I suppose alongside whimsical and magical, I also just felt that this book was really tender. And I suppose a lot of that is to do with the character Biddy herself and just how compelling and sympathetic she is. I will say the only thing that kind of took this down a notch for me, although I still absolutely loved it, don't get it wrong, was that it did feel like the story kind of wrapped up in a very satisfying way and I was kind of done, I was so happy with the book. And then it just kind of kept going for another 20 or 30 pages. It did almost feel like it could potentially be setting up a sequel without kind of creating too much uncertainty to leave you unsatisfied after this book. So it wasn't that there was anything wrong with those extra 20 or 30 pages, it was more just like I felt done and so having another you know like half an hour to read, it just didn't feel like it ended on the high point that it could have. So that's my only gripe, I was almost feeling like it was almost a perfect book for me and then it just it overstayed its welcome slightly. But I mean we've read seven books in this video, well I mean I finished six and DNF one, and although we had a little bit of a rocky start with a couple of those books, I feel like overall this has to be one of my best reading vlogs in a long time. Maybe ever? It did occur to me that I think technically A Skin Full of Shadows is listed as kind of like lower YA YA, and in the video where I spoke about my reading tastes and kind of figuring out if maybe historical fantasy is something I need to read more, I did 
did eliminate YA from that discussion entirely. So I almost feel like that was a little bit of a, that was a bit of a miss on my part, including that in this video at all. But regardless, whether you count me as having one or two books that I didn't like in this video, I had five that I had a great time with and three that I absolutely loved. So obviously Skin Full of Shadows and A Keeper of Enchanted Rooms or whatever it was called are the two books that I didn't like. But then every other book that I read in this vlog was great. I liked a lot. I think Tread of Angels would definitely be the book that like I liked the least out of the five books that I liked, but I still had a really good time with it and I really, really liked it. Sorcerer to the Crown was wonderful. I liked it a lot. I, I think I loved it. Like I said, there were definitely elements of the pacing and the writing that did feel a little clunky, not quite as refined as they could have been. And I think if those things were tweaked, I would just be telling you that I absolutely loved it. And then honestly, I couldn't tell you right now which book of these two I liked more, The Midnight Bargain and The Magician's Daughter. I really, I loved both of these. And honestly, they both I think would be appropriate for YA audiences. They kind of feel on the cusp of adult and YA. Both were that kind of coming of age journey for a younger woman. I adored both of these books and the reading experience, top tier. I laughed, I cried, I couldn't put either of them down loved them. And honestly, I would have been more than happy to have just read those books in this video, but to top it off with a book like The Monsters We Defy, like this, this was incredible. This was definitely my favorite book of the video. I do feel like there's just something about it that feels very refined and just honestly so special. There was so much that went on in this in terms of character development, setting, and then we had the whole mystery and heist and all of these different spirits and enigmas, and it was so emplaced in a community that felt so alive. And it was just so interesting, compulsively readable. I low-key feel like I found three of my favorite books of the year in this video, but this one is just like, honestly, it's on another level. This was so good. I need, I need a six star scale because that's how good this book was. So I'm thrilled. I think this is absolutely confirmation for me, at least, that historical fantasy is definitely a genre that seems to be ticking an awful lot of boxes for me as a reader. And to be frank with you, I have been filming this video for quite a while. And so kind of like towards the end of me filming this, I did upload my recent video talking about my journey reading fantasy overall and kind of like analyzing where I wanted to go with my fantasy journey. And in that video, I did ask you explicitly for some diverse historical fantasy recommendations. So I haven't read any of your recommendations in this video, but I have been keeping a close eye on those comments. And I definitely want to do a part two to this video because I mean, at this hit rate, like I just want to keep reading historical fantasy. I'm not going to lie. So thank you so much for leaving me those recommendations. And honestly, if you have more for me based on, I mean, we have even more data now that I've read all of these books, please, please leave them in the comments below. It feels like for so long, I've been trying to love fantasy and I've clearly had some very high highs, but it's, it's felt like a little bit of a slog kind of sifting through and trying to figure out what it is that I do and don't like. And I finally feel like I'm on the right track, at least with one subgenre. But thank you so much for hanging out with me. I know this has been a long video, so I appreciate you sticking with me. A big thank you as always goes to my wonderful patrons over on Patreon and especially a big thank you to Olivia, Lynette Brown and Marie. And I will talk to you all again in another video soon. Until then, chat with me in the comments and happy reading. Bye.